In the heartland of India, in the small town of Dabra in the state of Madhya Pradesh, lies the farm of Sugar Baron Vikram Savastrava, grandson of the late Sir J.P. Srivastava, one of the last night commanders of the Indian Empire of King Emperor George VI. And, living on his estate, is a Sufi mystic healer, Said Arif Hussain, also known as Baba Saib. On this sultry August evening in 2005, both men are walking towards a small hut in Vikram's personal compound, where a tribal Hindu village girl is the victim of possession and needs to be exercised. The two men also discuss Baba Sahib's pilgrimage scheduled for the next day. He is to drive to the village of Renaud, 100 kilometers away. This is both the ancestral home and burial spot of Baba Sahib's Sufi master, guru and spirit guide called Sheikh Haji Ali. Sufism is a moral and spiritual way of life and because of the element of mysticism in it, it gained respect amongst India's majority Hindu population Given the inclusivist nature of Hinduism, particularly in the Middle Ages, through its populist and reformist phase, during what is known as the Bhakti movement. The great Hindu text, the Rig Veda, says that the Almighty is one. The Sufi Weltanschauung is based on the postulate declared by the Prophet Muhammad that all people are the children of God on earth and that is reported by the text of Sunan e Abu Daud. The cornerstone of Sufi thought has been the Pir Murid, master-disciple relationship in which the disciple, with implicit faith in the master, receives knowledge from him in the form of commands and do's and don'ts. Baba Sahib's peer is the medieval Sufi saint Sheikh Haji Ali, whose seat of temporal power he's inherited. But Haji Ali is more like his spirit guide, as in medieval times only contemporaries could be peer murids or master disciple. It is this knowledge that Baba Sahib uses in exercising the spirit which has taken control of the girl's psyche. The fact that he is a Muslim and they are Hindus doesn't prevent the girl's grateful family from touching his feet as a mark of respect. <laughs> Baba Sahib served in the Indo-Tibetan Border Police, a paramilitary organization of the government of India. He was also an accomplished soccer player who played for his police team. One day, his wife persuaded him to read the Namas. That day it struck him how far out of touch he was from God and that his salvation lay in faithfully reading the Namas five times a day. As he drifted towards religion, he found his calling and after 13 years of rigorous spiritual perseverance, he was accepted as a true disciple and inheritor of worldly powers by his spirit guide, Haji Ali. Haji Ali is supposed to be a contemporary of Munyuddin Chisti, the 12th century founder of Sufism in India. While Baba Sahib waits at the railway crossing for the train to pass, over 350 kilometers away, aboard another train chugging into New Delhi from the suburbs, is a 12th grade schoolboy, Surya Supariwala. Surya has been researching a science project on the memory retaining abilities of water. Little does he know that the significance of water as a store of transmittable information is now gaining acceptance worldwide as a worthwhile subject of scientific investigation. Swiss chemist Louis Ray has published a paper in the reputable journal Physica A 
outlining his experiment using the processes of thermoluminescence to validate the memory of water. Another book on the memory of water by Michael Schiff tells the story of Jacques Benveniste, a highly respected French scientist whose career was blighted when he dared to expand the horizons of traditional science by demonstrating that water can retain the memory of the atoms it once contained. Brother, can I please show my science project now? Okay, my son. Our topic for our science project was water. I decided to go beyond what we know about water. But let's start with what we do know about water. 75% of the human body is made out of water. We drink water every day to stay alive. In fact, some of us even take homeopathic medicine, which is based on the memory of water. Memory of water? How can water have memory? And if it does, then does that mean that water can think or even feel? In Dr. Emoto's first experiment, he wrote the word thank you in Chinese on a bottle of water and froze it in minus 5 degree temperature. The result was this beautiful crystal formation. What happens is, the vibrations from the word travel and affect the water inside the bottle. And depending on what the word is, thank you, or negative word, it results in a positive or negative crystal formation. Take that one step further. If we even talk to water, if we were to abuse it, say something like, you make me sick, I will kill you, it would result in a disgusting formation. But if you were to tell it, I love you, thank you, please heal me, it would result in a crystal like this. And obviously, a crystal like this means the water is purer and better for us. Even by just thinking positive thoughts, water is affected. Over here you see, by someone just thinking, the water crystal is gradually becoming bigger and bigger, just by the power of thought. Over here is an example of water affected by music. This is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. All of us live in Delhi, so we know how horrible the water here is. We have to filter it, purify it, do this and that. But if you look to your left, that is a crystal formation of water from Delhi tap water. On the right hand side, there is a crystal formation of spring water. Now all of us cannot be as fortunate to always drink spring water, but we can take regular Delhi water and talk to it and pray to it and ask it to become better. And I'm sure that will benefit all of us. My project is inspired by Dr. Masaru Moto's book, The Messages from Water. I believe there's a lot of truth, uh, of truth to Moto's work because your body is mostly water. 70% of your body is water. And if water is affected by intention, by consciousness, by prayer, by sacrament, by ritual, then certainly water um, could heal not only our physical bodies but our planet. You know, we call it planet Earth, but it's planet water more than planet Earth because 70% of the Earth is indeed water. So what is water? Water is not H2O. Water is a living, vibrant substance. And the way we take a plastic bottle of H2O and turn it into water is very simple. There's a wonderful scientist called Emoto, and I hope everyone who watches this looks him up on the internet, if they can, and looks at his amazing pictures, because he's got pictures of crystals, snowflake crystals, made from water, where the bottle had love and gratitude written on it. And these crystals are beautiful, like dynamic diamonds. Whereas if there's hate and malice just written on the bottle, the water molecule, the crystals don't even form. So when they look at London tap water or Paris tap water as opposed to mountain spring water, there's a real contrast also. My point is that even if you're drinking London tap water or Delhi tap water, just charge it up with a little blessing of love and gratitude, or whatever it is, and you'll see that life force reanimate in the water, which in turn, being such a huge part of our being, is a very crucial thing for balance. So it's a little gift, if you like. Charge your water. Look at it. Give it a good eyeball. Say, I love you. Say, love and gratitude.
doesn't even need to be a, a spiritual thing, but just charge it up with some energy. Though it is widely believed that Haji Ali is buried on an island off the suburb of Worli in Bombay, Baba Saib says that this is not correct and his shrine is actually at Renaud. The shrine in Bombay was built by Haji Ali's disciple, or Murid, called Laka Banjara, whose sinking ship, full of gold and drowning sailors, was rescued by Haji Ali himself. This miracle was accomplished by Haji Ali defying or modifying the existing laws of quantum physics as we know them. This act forms the legend of Haji Ali. Thereafter, Haji Ali retreated into the cloisters and was followed by Laka Banjara, who also cloistered himself. Consequently, the legend of Renaud was replaced by the shrine at Bombay, which in all probability, if we follow Baba Sahib's story, became a decoy to keep people away from Renaud. These are the startling revelations likely to shake the faith of millions who have hitherto worshipped at the shrine of Haji Ali in Bombay. <laughs> We have no means to corroborate the veracity of what Baba Saheb is saying. We can only put his statement on record and at the same time marvel at the tranquility of Renaud. और आपका इतिहास गरीब नवाज के टाइम का ही इतिहास है और खास तौर पे जगह का जो महत्व है रन्नौद ये बलियों का मरकज है यहाँ 360 बली हुए हैं अपने टाइम पे 360 मजिदें थीं 360 बाबरियाँ हैं हिंदुस्तान में आमिर के बाद अगर किसी जगह का नंबर है तो वो आप इसी जगह का नंबर है वो लखा बन जा रहा है आमिर के पास गांव है उनका और आपके मुरीद थे जब आप इसी जगह पे अपनी हजामत बनवा रहे थे नाई से आपका सोने का जाल डूब रहा था आपने याद करा आप हजामत बनवाते में छोड़ के इसी बावड़ी के अंदर नीचे उतरे वहां जाके उसका जहाज बचाया तो लखा बनियाने में आपकी याद में मतलब वहां पे दरगाह बनाई बॉम्बे के अंदर और जब आप बावड़ी से ऊपर निकले तो आपके सर में खून निकल रहा था तो नाई ने पूछा आपसे कि साहब ये खून कैसे निकल रहा है तो आपने मना करा कि कुछ नहीं ऐसे निकल आया तो आप नाई बोलता है हुजूर मैं तो आपको गुलाम हूं मुझे तो बताइए हुआ क्या ये आपने बात बता दी ऐसा ऐसा हुआ कि जहाज डूब रहा था मैंने जाके लगा दिया जहाज बच गया उस नाई ने बेवकूफ ने पूरे जाके गांव में जाके चर्चा कर दी क्योंकि आप बड़े पर्देदारी पसंद है आपको और इस पर्देदारी के पीछे मुझे एक बार डांट भी पड़ चुकी है जब मुझे मिलना था तो थोड़ा जिक्र मैंने अपनी बहन से कर दिया था तो आप बहुत जलाल में आ गए थे उस दिन का दिन है आपकी जो पर्दे वाली बा, बातें हैं वो किसी के ऊपर नहीं करता ये लखा बाबा की दरगाह है ये हजूरी साहब के मरीज थे और मुरीज तो ऐसा हो जब आपने यहाँ पर्दा करा 
तो जब आप बॉम्बे से लौटे तो आपको पता लगा कि आपने पर्दा कर लिया तो आप, आपने पूरे परिवार के साथ पर्दा कर लिया Oh well I think I'm going to answer that question the other way around slightly and talk about this the science because there's something very interesting when you have an object it has mass it has a charge and it has a spin um mass relates to gravitational fields uh charge relates to electromagnetic fields and spin relates to uh torsion fields torsion is spinning the whole uh universe is spinning our chakras are spinning our acupuncture points a little spinning vortex of energy so on every scale we have this vortex um when people talk about healing they have this spinning vortex now as you know anyone who thinks of sufism immediately thinks of the whirling dervishes the way they uh dance round and round and i think this is a universal harmony at the end of the day we're standing on this ball we call earth which itself is spinning at a thousand miles an hour charging through to the constellation of hercules at god knows what speed but we feel like we're still this is one of the great wonders that we're surfing this ball at a thousand miles an hour and we feel we're absolutely stuck still I think what the Sufis are doing is they're embracing the universe much more by really going into its detail. Now, we mentioned earlier we we were talking about the dimensions and about uh, space. Maybe these three dimensions I just mentioned relate to those three dimensions of space and then there's time. Now, in quantum physics, superstring theory, string theory talk about 11 dimensions or 26 dimensions so what are these dimensions and do they each have their own field these are interesting questions and in our work we've come to really be interested as scientists in these characters the uh, a to z if you like of the spiritual world is there from ayurvedic practitioner all the way to a zen reiki master sufi being the s is in that alphabet of interest because they all overlap with their knowledge and when we look at them observe them doing their work we can see very interesting changes for example someone is a reiki master someone is a, a sufi someone is a um, reading the palms either the nar nari palms um These characters all have a very profound effect on the person that they're actually working with. Uh now we can see this effect. Uh, our institute has a number of different devices now which are measuring biofield activity. So for example if a healer comes into an environment with a patient suddenly you'll see this white light around that Let's not call them patients. They don't need to wait for anything. Let's call them client or visitor. The visitor comes, the white light is there, and the visitor draws from that white light what particular frequencies they require, what particular blend of colors they require to balance their own system. I mean, after all, the chakra mechanisms in the body are designed for um keeping the body balanced. the base chakra up to the crown chakra each responsible for a different sector of the electromagnetic spectrum each one is its own little satellite dish if you like a bush creates a flower when it needs something it needs to be fertilized pollinated in the same way body creates a chakra when it needs something the chakras are the petals of the glands the glands are like the plant bud So there's a huge amount of knowledge and chronology psycho neuroendocrinology is there psycho neuroimmunology um these are new areas of science where these two two branches the esoteric understanding of the chakras and the uh, uh, glandular system coming together with a total picture an integrated picture hi hey, my name's Mark Abadi I'm an occupational health psychologist I'm also a therapist of various modalities 
from reflexology to lymphatic drainage to aromatherapy. What recently I've been focusing on is the science of energy medicine and um, applying my scientific methodology to exploring that. Um, the project that I'm involved in at the moment is with the Centre for Biofield Sciences. It is a wide project and um, my role in it is equally wide. I'm, as I said, a psychologist and a therapist. I am looking at the different energy scanning mechanisms and the different scanning devices to try and pick out which ones are actually measuring some aspect of our energy system. For me, the body is split into mind, body and soul. Psychological system, energetic system and the physiological system. And each one of these gives an indication of the other. So currently, the system we're using uh, the majority of the time is called Polycontrast Interference Photography, or PIP for short. The PIP system works on an ambient light reflection from the human body. So it is like a thermal image except with light. And it looks at the intensity of light responding, bouncing off the body. We put people in this in a clinical light environment with no sunlight. And we try and replicate as much light information as possible. For this, you, we use a full-spectrum light, which is the closest we can get to uh, sunlight. So we put people in the full-spectrum light and we ask them to remove their clothes. The more of the skin that we see, we can see how the light is being absorbed and reflected by the body. In which case, it gives us a very small, very small window into understanding what is happening with the energy system of that body. So, for example, at the chakra system or the energy center system, take, for example, the heart. The heart chakra is responsible for an unconditional love aspect. It's our powerhouse. It really is where we power our body from. If there is a block at that chakra, whether it be on your right side, your masculine side, or your left side, your feminine side, if there is a block in that chakra, it will reflect itself in trying to absorb energy from the universe, from the cosmos. Now, in doing so, it subsequently ab absorbs light, which is a type of energy. As it absorbs light, it will appear darker. And that's what the machine technology picks out, is the darker and lighter patches on the body. Once you spread light symmetrically over the body, where it reflects differently is where your body is responding differently on each side. Because even though anatomically we're not the same, energetically we are. Energetically we're symmetrical. Energy is split down the center. One side is one thing, the other side is the other. Anatomically, obviously, your heart is a little over here and liver here and other different things in different places. So we scan the image and out comes a, a photo image, a, a bitmap or a JPEG on the computer. What we can do is we can print that out, we can put it onto a CD, we get the JPEG image, the bitmap image. And we analyze this photo by zooming in on the computer digitally and we go to each of the energy centers and we analyze it and we look at the body in terms of right and left hand side, masculine and feminine side. And we try and feed back from the consultation form and from the individual sitting in front of us exactly what is going on with their system. So treatment of the energy system, I say, is always down to the individual. The individual is the only healer. There are thousands of healers in the world who say, I'm very powerful, I can heal you, I can treat you. Same with the allopathic doctors, they want to be the, he the healers and the treaters. Really, these energy blocks that we're talking about are happening before they happen physically. So if I see an energy block in your liver, for example, that is energetic. It's not something that's physical, you can't have it operated on. There's no operation you can have. The main thing is that you have to start to accept what you're holding, what you're blocking, wherever it is and whatever it is, and start to let that go. The ancient Indians, the, the Vedics, the, the yogics, they have a saying, which is, let it go. And this is the principle of yoga, for example, because you should let it go. That is it precisely. It's, it's exactly about letting it go. And it's about training our youth and ourselves, most importantly, not to hold on to things and to let it go. If we hold on to a psychological issue, the reason why the psychological state influences our energetic state and influences our physical body is mainly through the endocrine system. We have seven endocrine glands, like we have seven major chakras, like we have seven days in the week, like we have seven deadly sins, like there are seven planets which influence us astro astrologically. We have seven endocrine glands and they are the emotional controls of the body. They control every single feeling you ever have. Whether you're tired, awake, happy, sad, up, down, any feeling you have is controlled by your endocrine system. 
The endocrine systems, as I said, are connected to the seven major chakra points of the body. So this is how energetically we can start to affect the psychological system through the physical system. And psychologically, if we've got an uprising of feeling, say stress, anxiety, that comes in the adrenal glands, the kidneys on the back of the body, and that comes through the solar plexus chakra. So if we are having stressful experiences, if, we're, if, we're told, if, we're, if people hold their breath when they talk, they hold their breath, then that solar plexus area closes down. And this is why breathing is such an excellent method of releasing. And this is why in yoga, the asanas, the breathing, are the most important aspect. It's not how far you can stretch your leg over your head or how far you can bend your back. It's how far you can put your body in a state of stress and still remain relaxed. Because when you open your body, you open the closet and then you clean it out. You can't clean out the closet unless you activate the muscles. So you can't let go of the memory inside your body until you use those parts that are holding memory. So really this is also the basis of homeopathy, the memory of water. Water molecules are fantastic. They have the ability to, 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 gra to grapple onto the DNA and form these incredible chains, which are basically information chains, and they form the communication network in the body. If thought can bring about such changes to water, imagine what they can do to the perception of the reality before our eyes. We see what we see because we know what we see. We only see what we believe is possible. The reality before us is nothing but possible movements of consciousness. We as individuals choose moment to moment out of those movements to bring our actual experience to manifestation. The world for us is not there independent of our personal experience. So who for each of us actually chooses among the various possibilities to bring the actual event into experience? This choice is made by the spirit in our body that actually decides the reality that we choose to see. Therefore, realistically, we create our own reality depending upon our level of consciousness and awareness. This is what quantum physics tells us. Therefore, apart from our own reality, all other realities coexist simultaneously and are complementary to each other. At the core of all these realities is unity. Everything merges into the unity. This is what the Hindus call the Atman, or God. Let's look at this in another way. According to some amazing new theories of physics, in particular the holographic theory. We find it relates one set of physical laws acting in a volume with a different set of physical laws acting on a boundary surface, as represented here by a juggler and his colorful two-dimensional image. The surface laws involve quantum particles that have color charges and interact very like the standard particles of particle physics. The interior laws inside the bubble are a form of string theory and include the force of gravity as experienced by the juggler, which is hard to describe in quantum mechanics. Nevertheless, the physics on the surface and in the interior are completely equivalent despite their radically different descriptions. In other words, the theories predict that the number of dimensions in reality could be a matter of perspective. Physicists could choose to describe reality as obeying one set of laws, including gravity, in 3D, or equivalently as obeying a different set of laws that operate in 2D, in the absence of gravity. Despite the radically different descriptions, both theories would describe everything that we see and all the data we could gather about how the universe works. Therefore, is the biofield's 2D existence a reality?
In January 2006, Northeastern University and University of California scientists said they might soon have evidence of extra dimensions on the basis of results from a neutrino detector at the South Pole called Amanda. Neutrinos are ghost-like particles from space that could surface probes to a world beyond our familiar three dimensions. This could provide the first endurance for a string theory and other theories that attempt to build our current understanding of the universe. These theories have developed to bridge the gap between the 20th century's two most successful theories, namely general relativity and quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics that confirms the existence of choice or free will at the atomic or micro level is incompatible with general relativity, the leading description of gravity that explains the universe at the macro level. General relativity postulates that everything is preordained and that the past, present and future coexist at the same place albeit in different dimensions. Perhaps, therefore, what can actually link quantum mechanics and general relativity is a theory of the consciousness. I'm very excited to, to be exploring all these different terrains. But you see, I'm not exploring willy-nilly. We have devices, measuring devices, which can actually identify things which have previously been unidentifiably, unidentifiable scientifically. So that opens up the whole subject. For example, uh, with uh, the electroscanning method and uh, PIP, which is a polycontrast interference photography, we're able to map someone's precise health. Now, I'll give you an example. There was a young girl, to protect her identity, I'll change the subject slightly, but there was a young girl who came to one of our clinics and she was a crack cocaine addict and uh, she was having very uh, sexual nightmares, rape and so forth. And um, when we filmed her, you could see this entity rushing around her body and diving into her body. Entity means what exactly? What I'm describing is like a rugby ball shaped red blob of mass of uh, energy, which you could quite clearly see within the equipment on the, the screen rushing around. Now, I didn't save that particular image to show you, but there are other cases that I can show you, and I will. But with this particular case, here's a normal, young, happy, healthy person goes down a wrong route into hard drugs and suddenly they're opening themselves up, exposing themselves up. Now this is, all these factors have made me realize the importance of this uh, aura, biofield. Now whenever you look at sacred art, whether it's of a Sufi saint or a, a Hindu uh, a philosopher or even a Christian Gnostic or saint, you'll see that halo painted around them. In fact, some have quite good detail of the crown chakra and the full body field and all the strands of light, biophoton emissions. This is now very much within the scientific world. We understand what this is. My point is that we're shining. We're shining with light. And this light protects us. No virus, no bacteria can enter someone who is so shining. Uh, it's only when we eat so much of processed foods that that biofield starts weakening and shrinking. And then we get what I call Achilles meridians, actual entry points for these vac virus bacteria to rush in. <laughs>
जरा गौर करिए हाँ What you have been seeing was the manifestation of different spirits through the medium Jalal, a farmer, whose body is a virtual thoroughfare for spirits to enter and leave after they receive benediction from Baba Sahib. आवाज इनको मिटना है, इनको मिटना है। देखिए क्या है? रावण भी पैदा हुआ, राम भी पैदा हुए। हुए। रावण का बनाव हुआ, राम अमर हो गए। तो वही इस दुनिया का निजाम है। अच्छे भी आते हैं, बुरे भी आते हैं। अच्छों का नाम रह जाता है, बुरे चले जाते हैं। बुरों को बुरे के ढंग से याद करते हैं। ये जीव believes that wandering and wayward spirits cause physiological and psychological problems, as was in the case of these two boys who are being exorcised. In the Christian belief system, possession is always associated with the devil. In the Eastern tradition, where reincarnation is an accepted belief, possession is not by the devil, but by wayward spirits who enter the physical body through breaches or tears in the aura or biofield. They then bind themselves with the soul. Depending upon the intent of the spirit, energy blockages manifest themselves, causing physiological and psychological problems to the individual under possession. Here you see a large gathering of lower middle and middle class Hindu women from traditionally conservative backgrounds being exercised by Baba Sahib. This assembly is a reflection of India's syncretic secular heritage that goes back to the Bhakti movement of the Middle Ages when the symbiosis of Islam and Hinduism gave rise to Sufism. These women accept and respect the Sufi master, who is a practicing Muslim, and they have voluntarily come to this assembly and submitted themselves to this mass cleaning of their respected biofields. Two women who you see being exercised go into different variations of a trance-like state and experience a tremendous churning or upheaval of their internal energies as the spirits are expelled from their system. Thereafter, they have to build up their biofields through prayer and chants to plug the tears which opened their bodies up to the spirits in the first place. Well, there's such a thing called spontaneous healing, uh, spontaneous remission, which science never understood. But now we're beginning to understand that your own inner intelligence is the ultimate and supreme genius that uh, mirrors the wisdom of the universe. And that by getting in touch with this deeper part of yourself, you can actually evoke the healing response. 
biologically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, even overcome the fear of death. The quasi-martial beat of the drum in the quadrangle of the Amar Joiti School for Handicapped Children in North Delhi synchronizes their daily prayer session. Today there's a difference. Leading their prayers is Baba Saib. The school's children are predominantly Hindus, and therefore, as he prepares them to receive his healing touch, Baba Saib encourages them to visualize their own gods and goddesses, as against visualizing the image of Allah. This school is a microcosm of what India is. A Muslim Sufi healer invoking the imagery of Hindu gods amongst Hindu children can only happen in India, where the syncretic idiom is a way of life. The children have a wide range of physical challenges, and it is their faith that Baba Sahib seeks to reinforce as he encourages them to commune with God, to bring them relief from their miseries. <laughs> And he works a minor miracle with a blind girl called Komal, whose sight starts getting restored as she receives the healing powers of Baba Saib. His healing powers permeate into her biofield and repair the wounds in it that cause her blindness. Whatever the explanation behind this miracle healing, the fact is that it is an interaction between the consciousness of Baba Sahib and the girl that brings out a transformation in her sight and reinforces the pathways of her brain that can now link her restored sight images to her existing ability to hear and feel. An illness or impediment in one's naturally endowed faculties arises from a severe emotional impact that creates a tear or a wound in the biofield. It is through such an opening that disease or disability manifests itself. जहाँ से इंसान की साइंस खत्म होती है, वहाँ से मालिक की साइंस चालू होती है। Missing where the science of man finishes, that's when the science of the Lord takes over. You know. और दूसरी बात, जो मेरे थ्रू जो इलाज हो रहा है, उसको मैं नहीं कर रहा, वो गॉड कर रहा है, मालिक कर रहा है। अब दिखाना चाहता है कि पावरफुल मैं हूँ, ना कि मैं, ना कि आप। वो किसी भी इंसान को संत बना सकता है, किसी भी इंसान को साइंटिस्ट बना सकता है, वो किसी का मोहताज नहीं है। साइंटिस्ट भी उसका मोहताज है और संत भी उसका मोहताज है, और सारी दुनिया उसकी मोहताज है। सुपर पावर इस गॉड, अल्लाह, ओम। हमारे what he's saying is that it is, it's not his body. It is the Lord which is giving him the pass or giving his body the pass to cure it, others. It is not him who's curing. He's a channel. He's a channel. His hands are a channel. His power is being channeled. The Lord is channelizing the power through his body. So he's saying 
whenever I cure people, don't be thankful to me. Be thankful to the Lord because He is the ultimate. What we are finding through information theories is that the raw material of everything in the physical world um, is something that's invisible. And that invisible realm is consciousness. So ancient wisdom tradition said that your reality, physical reality, is a projection of your soul. And today's modern theories are very coming very close to that understanding that there is such a thing, there is, that you have a soul, you have a spirit, and it manifests as your mind, as your body, as your perceptions, as your physical reality. And by getting in touch with this part of yourself, you become the, in a sense, the director, the choreographer, and the protagonist of your own movie.